Uh, welcome. My name is Amy L. Clark. Um, my pronouns are they and them, and I'm an affiliated faculty member in writing literature and publishing. I'm also the author of two collections of short stories and the novel Palais Royale. We're going to have three fantastic panelists today, um, and then at the end, we're going to have some time, hopefully, for question and answer. I'm going to ask that you do hold all of your questions to the end, um, and then we're going to try to use the raise hand feature to get to as many of you as we can, time and technology permitting. Um, so I'm going to start us off with a few opening remarks and then pass it off to the panelists because it's really all about them. Um, this year has been a year marked, of course, by the global pandemic and also the twin pandemics of white supremacy and institutional violence. We've seen government hatred and government indifference, the continued killing of black and brown people at the hands of the state, and of course, a rise in violence against Asian and Asian American people. We've also seen new legislation bent on further marginalizing and endangering trans and queer folks and women. It's also been a year of resistance, of resilience, and of survival. We have found ways of caring for ourselves and for each other. A new civil rights movement is thriving, and communities have come together in mutual aid. Each of us has a place in history as human beings, and this year especially, the knowledge of that is inescapable. We also have a place as scholars and as artists. The poet Joseph Brodsky said in his Nobel lecture that literature, not literacy, but specifically the act of reading nuanced, complex human stories makes it harder for individuals to commit acts of violence on behalf of some idea or ideology. And Chinua Achebe, who is my old undergraduate professor and, and friend, used to remind students all the time that when we read, when we write, when we create art of any kind, when we try to shape politics, and really just when we walk through the world, we should do so with equal parts pride and humility. It seems to me that that is especially good advice right now for making good art and good lives. Neither of them had to create art in this moment, but that's kind of the point. Our time is unique, but the things that we have to survive are not ours alone, and they're not really unprecedented. History is full of institutions, ideologies, and occurrences that are inhumane, unjust, and antithetical to life and to freedom. And yet every period of history has produced beautiful, meaningful, funny, and liberatory art. We are where we are right now because people just like you and like me have struggled and have survived and have created. So our questions today are really, what roles do art and artists play in shaping the world around us? Can art be a force for justice or a force for love? And how can art help us individually and collectively to survive? So as I said, we have three panelists today. I'm gonna introduce them one at a time and we're gonna hear from all of them. So our first panelist is Ed. Assistant Professor Ed Lee has been a comedy writer for over 20 years in formats as varied as sitcoms, children's animations, award shows, and comedy variety shows. Recently, Professor Lee wrote and produced a semi-autobiographical short film, Becoming Eddie. This film has been selected to 15 national film festivals and counting, including the SPE Media Film Festival, which begins today and the Santa Barbara International Film Festival, which is an Academy Award qualifier and will stream online from March 31st to April 10th. We're gonna drop a link to that in the chat. Um, <clears throat> Professor Lee teaches classes in the VMA department and the Comedic Arts BFA program. He is currently on leave in Los Angeles, developing the streaming series version of Becoming Eddie at Sony Pictures Television, writing various other projects and cultivating a face mask tan line. So go ahead, Ed, thank you. Um, thanks, uh, I appreciate that, Amy. And uh, I also just wanna take a moment to appreciate Jamaica and Tamia who I've gotten to know over the past couple of years. And um, I, you know, I really appreciate their uh, uh, welcoming presence and their, the sense of community that they've, um, that they've been uh, working on with um, a lot of the BIPOC faculty and staff. Um, 
I also just kind of want to preface my remarks saying that to say that they've changed over the past couple of days um, because the past couple of days have been extremely uh, emotional for uh, me and for a lot of uh, Asian American folks. Um, so if I, uh, if I express that emotion through uh, profanity, <laughs> It's partially to express that emotion. It's, it's also partially to just sort of shake people out of their doldrums, because um, it's not just a it's not an Asian American problem. It's uh, it it is a problem with the uh, people who are uh, perpetrating the racism. Um, so um, I'm also doing a presentation on my project becoming Eddie in a couple of weeks at the School of the Arts Assembly. So I apologize in advance if I repeat some of what I say today then. Uh, and right now I just wanna show you the 45 second trailer for my short film, and then I'll talk a little more about it uh, on the other side. So let me go to sharing. Uh, share sound. I think you need to hit play. Oh, sorry. It said that my, uh, sorry, hang on one second. Uh, for some reason it said my screen sharing was paused. Like I was sharing it and playing it, but it was, oh, the video isn't playing for us. If it's, it said screen sharing paused for some reason. Oh, the limitations of technology. Um, Eric, can you check on the screen sharing capabilities, please? It does say one participant can share at a time. So if there's something being shared. We did see your screen. Oh, you did see it, but you didn't hear the sound? Or well, you it looked like you hadn't hit play. The, it just didn't. Uh, let me try one more time and then. Okay, now it says I'm screen sharing. When I was in middle school, I did everything I could to fit in. Rad, it's Donger. Donger. I hate being me. I hate this damn jacket. I hate my goddamn name. Oh. Why can't I be a normal person? So I found solace in stand-up comedy. Family members, I'm Eddie Myers. I wish I was Eddie Myers. You heard me, motherfucker. Becoming You ever got to take the Burger King? Okay. <laughs> so that was it. You're muted. I'm just having technical problems all over the place, I'm sorry. Uh, Becoming Eddie is a comedy about my childhood in the 80s and my obsession with age inappropriate stand-up comedy. And it's about race and my relationship with race. I began writing this project in 2018 uh, to write about my identity and my frustrations as a kid of being born in New Jersey, but still being seen as a foreigner by my classmates because of my race. In this story, Yong, uh, the protagonist has to learn to accept himself in order to regain his own voice. The message is that it's okay to be who you are despite other people making you feel like an outsider. It's based on my childhood, but the honest truth is I didn't learn this message until later on in life, and I still sometimes struggle with it. What I do know now is that I shouldn't have ever been ashamed of being Asian American the people who were shaming me for Asian America should be ashamed. Uh, one goal that I have for this short film and the streaming series that is based on the short film is to normalize Asian Americans for non-Asian Americans. 
That comes from my anger and my frustration at how normal anti-Asian racism has been my entire life, even up to today. Many non-Asians think it's okay to treat us badly to our faces because they think that we are passive, that we won't fight back, that we have no power, that we're not here to make waves. And that stereotype is partially based in truth. Uh, my friend Helen Hong, who plays the mom in Becoming Eddie, uh, just released a YouTube series, a uh, web series called Old Korean Dad Stories, where she interviews her father and sometimes her mother, uh, who are Korean immigrants who live in Alston. Her dad uh, in the web series revealed an incident in February when a grocery store employee shouted at him in the parking lot and ran a shopping, co shopping cart into him just because he's Asian. When he went inside the grocery store to return an item, the employee followed him in and tried to intimidate him into not reporting the incident. He said he wasn't gonna report it anyway. He said uh, in, the, in the video, he didn't hurt me too bad. So I just thought, forget about it, just forget about it. And when he got home and took his shoe off, he saw that his sock was bloody and that he had uh, uh, broken his toe. Um, his attitude resonated with me because my parents would use the exact same words whenever I told them about a racist incident directed towards me. Just forget about it. That older generation mentality of not making waves in order to assimilate has A, not resulted in assimilation, and B, allowed that guy to think it's okay to keep doing it. So fuck that, right? Uh, I mean, we don't have to apologize to our oppress oppressors. They're the ones who owe us an apology. Uh, Becoming Eddie is about shattering stereotypes and misconceptions. One of those misconceptions is that Asians are unfeeling, that we don't have emotions. Well, we do. We hurt when we're marginalized, when we're underestimated, when we're spoken down to, and when we're made to feel like we don't belong, whether it's in this country or in a grocery store parking lot or even in an academic meeting. These misconceptions exist because they're perpetuated by mass media. Until recently, Asian American stories weren't considered marketable. In the 2011 Sony Pictures hack, it was revealed that Aaron Sorkin refused to adapt the Michael Lewis book, Flash Boys, because it featured an Asian Canadian lead, which meant the film would not be profitable, according to him. At that same time, a show called Two Broke Girls debuted with featuring an almost Mickey Rooney level Asian stereotype character. When one of the two white creators, Michael Patrick King, was confronted by a reporter about the offensive stereotype, he said he didn't care. He said, it's funny. And he said, because he's a gay man, he's allowed to stereotype. No one in power cared either. Warner Media and CBS report, rewarded Michael Patrick King with six seasons, and now he's show running the Sex and the City reboot. The needle has moved over the past couple of years. Uh, mass media is just beginning to show stories featuring Asian American protagonists that aren't Kung Fu masters. This is important because the general public has not had many Asian Americans with whom they can empathize. With my work, I want to create characters with whom Asian non-Asians can empathize to combat the lack of empathy that non-Asians have shown to us. The comedy part is just the sugar that makes the medicine go down. Uh, I'm trying to further this mission in, in terms of creating uh, Asian protagonists that people can empathize with uh, in other projects as well. So currently I'm working on a TV pitch with the Chinese American comedian, Joe Wong. He's from Beijing, got his PhD in molecular biology at Rice University and moved to Boston where he got a job at a biotech company. During that time, he memorized the Oxford English Dictionary. He read every English language classic book he could get a hold of. And he also began doing stand-up comedy. Uh, and because he spoke with a Chinese accent, a lot of comedians and club owners uh, and uh, audience members would talk to him like he was some sort of idiot. So imagine being someone who literally isolated a cancer-causing genome being spoken to by some people who never left the Boston area and can barely speak English themselves. Uh, he was so underestimated and he showed them all.
because he got booked on Letterman and he did what a lot of Boston comics did not do, which is get out of Boston. Um, so Joe and I met a couple of years ago and we bonded a lot over our mutual anger about anti-Asian racism in all its forms, casual or overt. Asian people all over the US are victims of hate crimes every day. Our recent president just recently put out a statement yet again calling COVID the China virus. Just two days ago, Asian women in Georgia were hunted down and murdered by a white man who the white sheriff said was fed up at the end of his rope and it was really just a bad day for him. For him, not for the Asian women who died. That's both the product and the symptom of racist dehumanization. And I'm fucking livid about it. I mean, after this year of COVID and after the murders, it just, it, it makes my mission, I feel, more important. People need to see Asian Americans as Americans. People need to see Asian Americans as human beings, as with all BIPOC people. And I do feel like even though my work is comedy and commercial in nature, that it's important to me um, that we have Asian, more and more Asian American protagonists in mass media so people can get an insight into our lives and be able to see that all the emotions that we feel and all the struggles that we go through. So I'm even more driven than ever to make my work count. Thanks. Thank you so much, Ed. That was fantastic. Um, again, I'm gonna ask that folks sort of hold on to questions until the end, and we're gonna um, hear from Tatiana now. Uh, Tatiana Johnson Boria is a writer, artist, and educator. Her work was selected as a finalist for the Black Warrior Review Poetry Contest, the Solstice Literary Poetry Prize, and received honorable mention for the 2019 Auburn Witness Poetry Prize in the Southern Humanities Review, judged by Vivi Francis. She's also received honorable mention for the 2020 Academy of American Poets Prize and is, the two, is a 2017 Pushcart Prize nominee. She completed her MFA in creative writing at Emerson College and is a 2021 Tin House Scholar. She also serves on the board of VITA, Women in Literary Arts. Find her work in or forthcoming at Plowshares, New Delta Review, Foundry, and others. Her writing explores identity, trauma, especially inherited trauma, and what it means to heal. Thank you so much, Amy, and thank you, Ed, for um, starting us off and the Intercultural Affairs Office for um, you know, holding the space for us. Um, I'm going to be talking a little bit about um, writing into survival. And just to preface, some of this is personal and very you know, secret to me, so I hope I'm not too emotional, but bear with me. Um, like everyone, the start of the pandemic completely reconstructed every aspect of my life. Um, I was finishing, as Amy just said, one of my MFA semesters in Emerson's program. I was teaching in the first year writing program and also adjusting to life working remotely. And in fall of vulnerability, I had just a month prior stopped taking antidepressant medication. And so I was thinking I was on my way up. <laughs> And the pandemic um, really sort of unraveled a lot of the things that I had um, built for myself in order to survive and to be alive. Um, all of the structures I built for myself as a writer quickly fell away. And I think a lot of people felt this way. Um, I heard many people say, I don't feel like I can write right now. I don't know um, how to write like I used to. And I knew that at the beginning of the pandemic, I would never go back to being the same writer that I was before the pandemic. That there was a lot of fracturing and severing that um, was happening in the world around me and within me. So I was able to write something, 
the first poem that I wrote uh, during the pandemic was actually about my experience coming to Emerson right before the lockdown. Um, I don't know if anyone else remembers that, but um, I remember getting off the train station, the, getting off the train at the Chinatown stop, the orange line, and just seeing everything empty. There was no one around. And just how eerie it felt to um, see the world at the standstill. Um, I walked by the usual um, um, St. Francis House, the homeless shelter that's near Emerson. And I remember seeing fewer people than usual, but seeing them and thinking about them and wondering how they felt. Um, it also reminded me of my family and our experience with homelessness growing up. And it also reminded me of my mother and her experience with homelessness most of her adult life. And I found myself in worry. When I um, heard the word immunocompromise, I thought of her. I thought of her pre-existing conditions. I thought of not being able to see her because of all of the risks. I thought of the other residents in a group home where she was now. Um, I also experienced not hearing from my mother for a long time at the start of the pandemic um, and the rising worry that came with that. Um, my mother never uses a cell phone, <laughs> so she uses a landline. And um, I found myself in the middle of the pandemic not being able to get in contact with her and finding out later that she had been in the hospital for days um, for a diabetes related issue and that um, no one had my phone number in order to reach me. So here I was when um, she came back to her group home trying to socially distance with the mask, teaching my mother how to use a cell phone for the first time. I was worried about her risk. I was worried about mine. I also worried how long we all might be able to exist in this way. Um, simultaneously, I felt the stakes of my own mental world heighten. My own depression and anxiety were more rapid than ever, and I know many people experience this. Um, the mounting expectations from your job, from school, from work, it was almost as if there were two narratives happening. Um, the one where we were in a pandemic and trying to stay safe for ourselves and one where we were needed to produce. And um, all of these parts tugged on my existence, making each day more and more difficult. It didn't help that I would see the videos and stories and know that people like me Black people, um, trans people, Asian people, people of color were dying and continuing to die um, and being killed in violent, awful ways. Not just because of the pandemic, because of police brutality and white supremacy. And in the midst of the pandemic, I found myself in the middle of Franklin Park at a protest with thousands of other people looking at photos of George Floyd, Ahmaud Arbery, Breonna Taylor, and so many others. I thought of my own blackness, my own fragile mind, my own risk of not being alive. I didn't think then that we were all surviving, that the rallying, the check-ins with my mother, the seeking of care of myself and the things that felt imperative were also moments that made me fight for my family, for my community, for my own existence. Sometimes surviving means that you're simply doing the things that need to be done, even in the presence of grief and fear. So in the presence of grief and fear, I continue to check in on my mother. I wear a mask. I walk miles and miles on protests. Um, I check in on my community. I check in on myself and I return to work, I think that continues to remind me of what it means to survive and to heal. Lucille Clifton says that poetry can heal because it comes from a heart, it can speak to another heart. And I'm always wrapping myself up in that understanding of language. Even in knowing my writing life has shifted I can't escape their urgency and ability for writing to operate as a healing mechanism. 
When I write a word or a line, I don't always know I'm acting in repair of myself. Sometimes the words are stuck. Sometimes they resist. Sometimes they pummel their way into meaning. It means that they too are alive. These words are alive in their richness. And I watch us on the page together, reckoning with existing. Lucille Clifton's work has served as a salve for me in our current world. And I've been engaging with the writing process differently by seeking out writers like her whose work has been healing for me personally. I think so often about the poem um, by Lucille Clifton, Won't You Celebrate With Me? And it's a celebration of surviving. I actually don't have the link, but I'll throw it in the, the chat later. Um, but I've been thinking a lot about this poem, especially in yearning for peace and safety, and thinking about my writing process as imperative, as a need for reclaiming my existence in this world. Um, so I wrote a poem that I think is in conversation with that poem. And I have a link here for just accessibility reasons if folks want to be able to read it. So I can put it here. But it's one of the poems on this site called Lucille Celebrates the Living. And this will be the last thing I say. Thanks for bearing with me as I almost emotionally crumbled on Zoom. Um, this is called uh, Lucille Celebrates the Living. Something has failed to kill the disquieting bones. A celebration erupts from a corpse in descent. Watch them smile in delight. Every tooth a result of someone's prayer. Starshine suckles the tongue. How the mouth carries him. The shaking of limbs, rhythmic, divine exorcism. Won't you witness seance in body? Won't you see the curve in our backs? The music gliding over? Won't you watch our thriving? Won't you carry us into song? By the world clawing away years of breath just because we were born. What kind of life leaves us unhaunted by our home? There are no parties where ghosts do not dance with us. There are no parties where ghosts do not dance with us. What kind of life leaves us unhaunted by our home? By the world clawing away years of breath just because we were born. Won't you carry us into song? Won't you watch our thriving? Won't you see the curve in our backs, the music gliding over? Won't you witness seance in body, the shaking of limbs, rhythmic divine exorcism? How the mouth carries him, starshine suckles the tongue, every tooth a result of someone's prayer. Watch them smile in delight. A celebration erupts from a corpse in descent. Something has failed to kill the disquiet in bones. Thanks everyone. Thank you so, so much, Tatiana. Our next panelist is um, Nathaniel. Nathaniel Justin Miano is a queer Puerto Rican born and raised in the working class suburbs of Southern California who uses performance to subvert apathy. He's the founding artistic director of Naked Empire Buffoon Company, with which he devises and tours across North America with outrageous physical comedies that satirize society's worst dysfunctions. Currently, he is co-creating and directing a new one-person show called Karen, which satirizes white fragility among progressive white women. It opens for live streaming in June. As a community advocate, he has served as a manager for programs out of the LA Gay and Lesbian Center, the National Conference for Community and Justice, and Cornerstone Theater Company. His recent advocacy work fo focuses on social justice in the workplace and in performance pedagogy, and is highly influenced by the teaching of Art Equity's National Facilitator Training, Nicole, uh, sorry, Nicole Brewer's foundational anti-racist theater training, Adrian Mari Brown's Emergent Strategy Network, and Claire Warden's Intimacy Direction Training. Now, he is an assistant professor in the Performing Arts Department and in the Comedic Arts Department. Thank you, Thank you Amy. <clears throat> Thanks, uh, everybody, uh, for being here. Um, uh, I'm just breathing because I'm nervous. 
Um, hi. Uh, I, I wanna start with some gratitude um, to you, Tatiana, to you, Ed. Um, and I also, uh, I also wanna uh, share that it's no small thing uh, to share space with you, Ed. And so I'm gonna get a little, uh, I'm already feeling it emotional. Um, and it, it really does link to both this moment that we're both on the same panel, but also um, uh, to my entire time here at Emerson. I've been here since the fall of 2018. Um, and Ed is the first uh, person who I was about to work with that reached out uh, to me um, outside of maybe the folks that I, the supervisors who were guiding me through all the technical and administrative aspects of this job, uh, simply to say, hi, <laughs> I, I, hi, we're going to be in community together. Uh, do you know where you're moving? Do you, do you know what's going on? Um, and I know I've told you this, Ed, and I've, I've shared some gratitude to you, but I'm going to do it now in front of 168 people because it's, um, it is something that I remember uh, being so absolutely necessary to me and essential to community building and trust building and having someone in a, a group of people uh, to lean on and a practice of leaning on one another um, that I'll talk about in just a moment. So I wanna lift you the hell up because you deserve it. Thank you. Um, uh, all right. So the question on this, uh, this that was asked to think about is how do we find our footing as creatives while dealing with the challenging circumstances of our present moment? And I thought in response to this question, I'd share just a bit about my creative practice and then share a bit about how I'm applying that practice to the moment that we're in. I'm a multi-hyphenate theater artist. I've trained and I work professionally as an actor, a director, a divisor of new work, a movement designer, and a producer. And my greatest passion is Buffon work, which I'll talk about. And since 2009, I've been the artistic director of Naked Empire Buffon Company. Now, Buffon is this bold, it's rarely seen comedic performance style. Um, it's designed to both charm and challenge an audience uh, pretty directly, directly and maybe even ruthlessly. Its roots are in satire um, and the work compels spectators um, through grotesque costuming, outrageous physical comedy, audience interaction, um, resonating, resonating with the tragic circumstances or truth that they're telling, poetic imagery, and uh, my preference is to um, fold in um, and ground it in social commentary and social relevance. As Buffon makers, we're making, we make looking at difficult truths easier by electrifying the space with these gratuitous, these shameless creatures who use wit and mockery and parody. They might sing, they do some mime, they might dance, they imitate archetypes and inanimate objects. Um, and they use all of these tools to shine an irreverent and mocking light on things like oppression, discrimination, prejudice, bigotry, imperialism, and the like. And these shows are designed to be equal parts disturbing and delightful. They're poetic and they're also um, topical. They're tragic and they're hilarious. And we found that since Buffons bring with them this frenetic and visually arresting hilarity, that they are also profoundly disarming. And that's one of their major effects. That's, that is that over the years, we've seen audiences actually lean in and laugh at themselves, potentially, possibly for the first time, uh, in specifically the, seeing their own complicity in whatever societal dysfunction that we're addressing. And this is why I do what I do. This is why I do this work specifically. It's to look at ourselves collectively with clear eyes, admit our complicity and provoke a discourse that leads to action. Our shows have addressed hypocrisy and apathy in the queer community of San Francisco. We've looked at capital punishment and state violence, fear of mortality, class privilege and its inextricable link with uh, whiteness and uh, race, American imperialism, and police brutality, among several other themes. Um, some of the gifts that Buffon brings me as a practitioner, and I hope as a, for my audiences is in terms of receiving it, is there is a uh, robust 
ec ecstasy and joyousness um, in, in these entities and how they live their lives. They are the embodiment of shamelessness. And in so doing, they are the antidote to um, what uh, social worker and storyteller Brene Brown talks about in, in what brings us, what, what cuts off connection, which is shame. Um, she talks about how uh, shame is something that we all have, it's universal. Uh, nobody likes to talk about it. And the, the less you talk about it, the more you have of it. Um, and uh, in so many ways, Buffon subvert all of those um, truths um, and get us to actually move uh, and direct our attention to things that we were avoiding. There is a power that they bring to admitting brokenness. Um, I talked to you about the grotesque costumes. Their bodies are, are wildly... Um, uh, distorted uh, in order to sort of make them non-realistic and, and uh, fun to look at um, and laugh, but also to as a uh, as embodiment of admitting admitting our brokenness, admitting our flaws. Uh, they also bring the power of seeing. They see the audience. There's no fourth wall. I talked to my students around of Buffon about how their corkscrew eyes bore into our facades and see the truth of our humanity, and they still say, "Let's party." Let's let's um, let's dance in this um, life together. They also bring the power or make make uh, visible the power of community. Buffon's greatest strength is in their group and choral movements. they the, the the best Buffon work is when there's a collective of of Buffon's working together. Um, I'm applying this practice that I have of Buffon work um, in this current moment in a, in a few specific ways. I'm creating a show as, as uh, Amy mentioned uh, right now. I'm, I'm co-creating it, I'm directing it. Um, and the star of it is a woman named Sabrina Wenski. She's in San Francisco, we're rehearsing over Zoom. Um, the show, it directly addresses white fragility and how white supremacist delusion manifests specifically amongst white folks who identify as progressive. I think the conversation like this teach-in uh, is quite robust when it comes to race and racism and some of its specificities. Uh, but what I have personally experienced um, myself, uh, and I've also uh, look at myself in my own work, um, I am a mixed race, uh, light skin person who walks through the world uh, with a great deal of white um, privilege and proximity, um, and I'm trying to, and the majority of my audiences uh, are also self-identify as progressive and predominantly white, and I want to um, not let us off the hook. I want to put us on the hook with the show. Um, the show will be a, a live stream experience in June. The next show is that I started working on is an anti-colonialist -colonial, satire that centers my Puerto Rican identity and how so many of us Puerto Ricans carry the history of both being the colonizer and the colonized in our bodies every day. That piece will be hopefully performed live and in person in the spring of 22 here in Boston. Uh, and lastly, I'm also working to bring the tools that I've learned from practicing Buffon into larger conversations. To that end, in November, HowlRound Theater Commons published a series that I co-curated and wrote for about how the combination of activism and clown work and clown uh, Buffon work is sometimes considered a, a, a sister, um, you know, stepchild or cousin of, of clown. Uh, we co-curated a and I co-wrote a series about the combination of activism and clown and how there is actually a long global tradition. Uh, to the combination of these practices. I'm gonna share with you, just to give you some images, a couple of, uh, so that you know about this. Hold on, let me share my field view. Sharing screen. Sorry, one moment. Maybe, no, oh, now it's, now it's getting hard to do. Uh, I'm going to share a link in the um, in the chat that shares with you that series so that you can do some further reading. There it is. Lastly, um, Buffon practice 
is my outlet for so much of the bullshit that I observe and the bullshit that I experience. Uh, I try to channel that um, angst and anger, pain. Some of it is trauma. Some of it is my own uh, angst and denial and, and complicity uh, in order to uh, it, put it into the art and provoke, wake up, unearth, unveil uh, the truth in order to subvert apathy and silence and inaction. Buffon itself as a practice is also a means of self-examination. It actually it requires a great deal of research um, and finite truth because the, the scalpel work of satire is, um, for it to be effective needs to be precise. Um, the first question I ask in all of my work is including now as a professor is how I am personally complicit in whatever issue I'm targeting. And when it comes to white supremacist delusion, I then ask how can I leverage my access to and my proximity to whiteness, to uh, uh, white faculty, to white students, to predominantly white audiences and neighborhoods to disturb and inspire folks into discourse and in action. It influences how I teach because it prioritizes play um, and discovery through play. Uh, it helps to prioritize the uncovering and validating of the most challenging barriers that we face and to do so as a collective, as a community, uh, which is what Ed taught me the first thing, um, the first time when I first got this job in the summer of 2018. Thanks for listening.